Hi, my name is Brett Linkletter, CEO and founder of Misfit Media, the best damn restaurant marketing agency on the planet. Here at Misfit, we help restaurant owners grow and scale their business through strategic online marketing practices. Right now, you're listening to our podcast, Restaurant Misfits, where we'll discuss all things related to restaurant marketing, management, and everything else in between growing a restaurant business. This podcast is also brought to you in collaboration with Total Food Service. For over 30 years, Total Food Service has provided the restaurant and food service industry with exclusive interviews to the latest news on products, trends, associations, and events. You can sign up for a free monthly subscription by visiting TotalFood.com today. And from all the misfits over here, we hope you enjoy the show. Cheers. In this episode, I interview Stephen Yen, the executive chef of Tao, downtown in New York City. Stephen has been with Tao for about a year now and has been a really killer addition to their team. As for his experience, Stephen was on the opening team for Fatty Q in Williamsburg, where he worked with Eddie Wong and later worked with Eddie at Catch. Now, for those who don't know who Eddie is, he was a top chef season three winner and proved to be not only a great chef to learn from for Stephen, but also a great stepping stone for him. Now, as a nicer sit-down concept, Tao has had to make some major adjustments to their business model in order to stay competitive and thrive during this year. In this episode, we will address those changes on what they have done as a business overall, but also the specifics on what Steven has done as the executive chef in collaboration with the brand and marketing team to help Tao succeed. And so without further ado, let's dive right in. Steven, how are you? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely. Absolutely. We're so glad to have you on the show today. Um, what an amazing and interesting year it's been, just to say none the, you know, none, nonetheless. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah, for a lot um, of words. <laughs> yeah, right? It's, it's been an interesting year, especially, obviously, with the election that's happening at this exact moment while we do this podcast. Um, how, how have things for you guys been at Tao Group, and how have, how have things been as the executive chef? So things, uh, knock on wood, things are moving in the right direction. Um, it's a really strong brand that has been built over the years. Um, so as far as clientele and guests returning to, to in-room, you know, in-house dining, it's definitely moving in the right direction. We, we are taking every precaution, cleaning nonstop, uh, sanitizing nonstop, keeping everyone away from each other. If you get up from your table, you know, we have plenty of security guards enforcing a mask uh, six feet. So oh, it, wow. it's definitely, it's definitely been crazy. Um, you know, we've had properties that have opened and had to close and then reopen because of uh, positive tests and staff. Um, but you know, that, that was mostly in the West coast, nothing, knock on wood, nothing in the East coast has happened um, of that nature. And we really hope we don't have that, but you know, it's, it's 2020, anything. Um, the funny thing is the last, I'd say the last 10 years of my culinary career, it's been learning how to hit curveballs. You know, anyone can hit a fastball. It's learning how to hit a curveball is what's going to set you apart and make you a better chef, a better manager, you know, a better person. And I think 2020 was the game where uh, it was nothing but curveballs, you know. And then when yeah. just when you think you have everything in your grasp, another curveball comes. Um, you know, it's like it's a funny thing that chefs joke that in culinary school, they should turn off the gas in the middle of service and be like, okay, guys, keep going. This is real life, you know, or your chicken doesn't show up one day. doesn't matter. He's still open. What are you going to do? You know, that's so I think having that mental mindset in 2020 is the only way you're going to stay positive and really succeed. You know, I don't know if succeed is even a great word to use, but survive, um, you know, and then hopefully in 2021, we get to thrive, you know, from surviving leads to thriving. So that's the, that's the next, evolution of what we want to happen um you know obviously everyone keeps saying we want to get back to where we were i don't even think that's a great mentality i think we want to get to a place that it's better than where we were you know we want to learn from what happened in 2020 take that keep everyone safe keep all of our guests safe keep all of our employees safe um and then be profitable you know we we are we <clears throat> are in it for a business you know absolutely well yeah you said that, i mean this year has been an ultimate curveball um, and that's what, you know, all of our clients have been saying, now, you know, obviously we work with a lot of restaurants all over the world. And one of our clients told us, you know, COVID-19 specifically has been 
the ultimate gut check of do you do you really love this business right do you do you really really want to be a restaurateur right is this what you are truly sure. meant to do because for everyone that it's not what's in their complete heart it's not something they they really want to die for they're already gone right yeah those absolutely. guys those, those ships have sailed so i mean yelp reported to us that 44 percent of restaurants have closed this year and aren't coming back so major major dip in this industry obviously but it's it seems like i mean you're saying that you guys are just you know surviving how how is it how has it been as far as like as the business i know you guys obviously you're you're, you're getting through it but you know, have, what kind of drop have you guys seen in business overall, and, and and what kind of shifts have you guys seen as a company? Sure. Um, so <laughs> as far as like you know, we're we're operating at twenty five percent indoor dining. Um, yeah. We are it. It's almost staying true to that as far as the numbers and finances go. It's definitely it's a brand where people are traveling to come eat here. We're still doing over five hundred covers on Saturday nights. Um, you know, we're lucky enough to have a place that we can fit 187 people legally inside at one time. So we are very lucky in that sense. Um, yep. You know, I think just like Broadway, the show will go on. There is, of course, so many restaurants in New York City that have closed down, not going to come back. Believe me, there is plenty of chefs, plenty of restaurateurs, plenty of people out there that are ready to sign that lease tomorrow. Plenty of concepts that are going to go into uh you know fruition this is this is a time where just because one stage is closed or one door is closed doesn't mean another one's not going to open um yeah. you know as we always say in our dna we're all chefs are like fatal masters can you get hurt every single night show up tomorrow after your battle licking your battle wounds clean showing up yeah. tomorrow doing it all over again and doing it all over again that you know it's definitely a different breed of uh humans in the restaurant business and yeah. I think, like you said, the ones that couldn't hack it, they're gone. And the ones that just thrive and love and love it, we're still here. Absolutely. Steven, kind of curious, what was your inspiration overall to, to get into this business and to become a chef? Um, it was, you know, being an adrenaline junkie, uh, seeing, you know, I started in the front of the house. You know, I've done almost every job in the front of the house and just spending time with the chefs in the back of the house was one of those things where, okay, I can, I knew how to cook at home. Um, yeah. I love to eat, you know, and <clears throat> before you knew it, it's like, okay, I'm spending way too much money on going out to eat. My friends and I were in college and we we're like, Hey, you know what? Maybe we can make this. And they're, uh, they looked at me and they're like, yeah, I think, you know, of all the people, this should be you, you try this out. So we would go to the grocery store, get groceries. I'd come home cooking and we're like, wow, that, that came out really good. Um, and then one day I just decided to pick up and go to the French Culinary Institute. And uh, from the second week, I started working for Zach Palaccio at Fatty Q in Brooklyn. And yep. <laughs> literally, because the culture at Fatty Crab and Fatty Q was, it was such a strong culture. It made, it made you seem like this was a cool club that you wanted to be part of. You know, you wanted to be that badass line cook, that badass chef that could throw down whether, you know, the thousand covers, the 300 covers didn't matter and then be able to smile at the end of the night and say, give me more. That's what really, really drew me to, to the kitchen. Um, and I think that's what still keeps me in the kitchen. Um, you know, the camaraderie, the, you know, the brigade system that has got really tailored towards after the military. My first year of college, I went to Norwich, which is the oldest, America's oldest private military school, you know, and it, wow. I left and went to BC after, but just having that, you know, becoming a cadet without actually getting sent out to war, it's like the best training because I got broken down, rebuilt, but then I never got PTSD, you know? So it was like having <clears throat> all of that mental, I got it. all of the mental fortitude without having any of that, you know, flash goes off and I hit the deck, you know? Um, yes. That's what I think was a huge part of the, being in the kitchen it reminded me of that world, you know, where it was something I always wanted to do and I never, I never got to do. So then it was kind of, okay, this is the second best thing. It pleases myself and the family, you know? Um, and then being able, I love working with my hands and yeah. I know this might sound weird, but watching someone eat my food or, you know, the food that we create and seeing that smile and making them happy, it really, 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 makes us happy makes me happy as a chef totally you know? so being able to work with my hands and then have people be so happy with what we just created it's that instant gratification 
people always joke that, you know, millennials are all about instant gratification. And I'm not going to argue about that. We are 100%. If I can have something now, I want it now. And if I can make you and your guests happy tonight with what we cooked and what we served you, that means more than anything to me. Absolutely. That's amazing. Well, that's, I, I, I've never actually spoken to anyone who's, who's related their work in the kitchen as, as being, you know, from, as a cadet. (laughs) It's amazing that that similar mentality. So you're, you're, I mean, you're, you're, you're a fighter. You sound like obviously you like being around people. Again, you like using your hands. You like making people happy. Um, That's awesome, man. And and I think, I think a a lot of other restaurateurs can obviously relate to that. Um, Very, very cool. Interesting. Talk to us about what you think, you know, based on right now, you know, it, you guys are obviously uh, more of a fine dining sit down concept at Tao Group, right? When you look at opportunities yep. right now for restaurants during this exact time that we're in, do you see more opportunities specifically in the fast casual space, or do you think sit down is the opportunity, no, or is it so kind of a mix? I think, I think sit down is so right now our dessert sales have tripled. It is because the nightclub. Oh my closed. god! There's nowhere to go. There's no there's no bars to go hopping at after dinner. Everything closes pretty early. So people don't want to go home. They don't want, you know, in New York City, you have very, very, very small apartments, even smaller kitchens. So therefore, you have a lot of people eating out. Um, Yep. And then you have, um, with that, you have all the fast casual is kind of gone because all the people that were used to work in the corporate offices don't exist anymore. They're all working from home. Um, I I did a short stint with Dig In, now called Dig. And we used to have people come stand in line for lunch. And we would say, hey, you know, you can order your food online and then just come pick it up. And they would say, we don't want to. We want to stand in line. This 20 minutes online, it allows me to be on my phone, talk to my friends. Um, you know, and the fact that the, the bags at Dig In were millennial pink. You know, there was a target for it, right? And there was a lot of money to be made from the kids and the people that were working in these corporate offices. But now that doesn't exist. So fast casual doesn't really exist you know i have a friend he he works for an investment group and they have like 220 taco bells and wow. their taco bell drive-ins the, the taco bells that had drive throughs have skyrocketed in sales versus um the ones where you have to walk in so it's just saying that yes there is there is a there is a market for fast casuals i personally think it's more about the drive through versions because the people in the city have really fled from the city to go to the suburby suburban areas um yep sit down yes if you can find a place with rent that you will be sustainable that's going to thrive because people do want to come out they do want to be served we are all creatures where we'd like to be pampered i don't you know who doesn't want to go to the spa spend a day at the spa who doesn't want to go out and when you want to celebrate something you go out to dinner right that's or yeah. you celebrate something you get ice cream totally so that's people crave that experience pleasure. yeah so I think, Especially right now. I think sit down, yeah, I think sit down restaurants are going to come back stronger than ever. I think fast casual, there will be more of a meal prep, um, more of a meal prep side to it where you see more and more people are getting healthier, going to the gym, you know, really want to take care of themselves. They see 2020 has led to, you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. So yeah. let's try to be as healthy as possible. So I do see meal prep and fast casual surviving, but in a sense where like, you know, sweet green and chopped and just salad and all that were really competing for your dollar. It's not that case anymore. You know, it's one of those where people are now interested in how to make those different salads. Like, how do I make this dressing? How do I make that? Because you saw people like the fact that the baking aisles in supermarkets were empty during the shutdown. People are cooking at home, you know, and they're, they're wanting to learn the stuff that they buy, you know? Interesting. Yeah. For, I, I know for us, especially our pizza concepts, you know, for them, what was actually so successful during this time was the, the make it home pizza kits, right? Hey, you know, we're, yep. we're going to send you the dough, the cheese, the topping, so you can make it yourself. People want that sure. experience. I think um, I read a book. I, I'm blanking on the name now. It's, it was a book that was about P.T. Barnum, who, you know, was, was uh, in the circus okay. business way back in the day. I think one of his sayings he says was, people will spend their last nickel on fun. They always spend their last nickel on having this, fun. This sounds like a uh, Malcolm Gladwell. Maybe is it? Sounds, it's not. It it's, I have. Re- I read that book no? as well, a long okay. many years ago. But yeah. maybe they. I mean, obviously, Peter Martin, pretty famous guy. But his whole thing is is in business, you, you have to strive to make everything more fun in general, no matter what kind of business you're in, right? And it and it sounds like obviously you're on the exact same page. I mean, people are craving 
social attention. People are craving yeah. seeing other people. Um, I know for our clients, especially in New York, I mean, New York, obviously during COVID saw a huge shutdown and now you guys are still at 20, 25% capacity at this yep, point. Still indoor. 25% right now. Yeah. yeah. So it's, I mean, I, I don't, I don't blame people for wanting to have that experience. I mean, I'll tell you for me personally, I, 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 I love going out, right? I, I, I want, I want to get yep. served too. I, I <laughs> you know, it's, especially right now, you, yeah, you can't go to bars, you can't go out to clubs or whatever else you, you might do to see other people. The only social aspect yeah. you have is the restaurant space. So yep. I, th- I think it's a good point to bring up. I mean, people talk about all the negatives of what's happened this year, but also what about the positives? There's opportunities right now. Hey, a lot of restaurants have shut down. That's unfortunate. That sucks, right? Obviously that's not what we all want, but for those who are still in business, well, there's less competition, right? Less competition. To, there, yeah. Right? Definitely I mean, less competition. I think it's, and it's now you, you have to push yourself to be better. You have to be bigger, faster, stronger every single day. You have to rework your recipes to make sure they're the best because now, you know, if someone, people are a little wiser on where they spend their money. So yep. if someone says, okay, I just bought your pizza. Hey, I made pizza last week. I think my pizza was better than your pizza and they're never going to buy your pizza ever again versus holy shit. I tried to make that at home. It didn't work out. I, that's why I'm going to go to Brett's pizza, you know? Totally. Totally. Um, very cool. And Steven, you, you guys obviously are, are very famous restaurant group. Tao Group is, is phenomenal. You guys seem like you're just always kicking ass, honestly, from the outside, looking in. You guys look awesome. Yeah. Um, you mentioned also that you, know, you, you got into this kind of business because you, it seemed like kind of the cool thing to do. The camaraderie seems really, really much there. And, and it, Tao is a very cool place to go to. Um, you know, working at, at Tao and working in this business, how do you – I mean, what do you feel like is the most, the, the biggest reason for that kind of success with Tao? I mean, how did Tao become just such a cool place to go to? What, what is kind of your guys' secret, you think? I think the secret is treating the employees just like the guests. You know, you want to yep. make sure your guest experience is the best experience possible. We do yep. the same exact thing for our employees. During the shutdown, you know, thousands of employees were, uh, not to use the word furloughed, but, you know, they were laid off. And Yes, there was a lot of money raised and a lot of money distributed out within the company for the employees that couldn't collect the employees that had more financial situations than, you know, beyond the average. Um, We also give, we do groceries for all of employees once a week. We have been purchasing all back to school, back to school supplies for all the employees, kids, even former employees. You don't even need to be a current employee right now. Um, Tau group will buy your kids backpacks and now even Thanksgiving, it's a full full Thanksgiving dinner with the sides, a coupon for a turkey. So it is really, you know, there's some, some of these guys have been here for 17 years, 18 years. You know, a lot of the guys in this kitchen have been here eight, nine years. You know, the restaurant's only been here 10 years, this one. So it wow. is taking care, of, taking care of your employees as the same way as you take care of your guests goes so far. You know, it's, it's like the... Um, the famous, you know, it, instead of hiring a new guy, what are you doing wrong to, why aren't you keeping your staff? You know, why are, why is the, why is it a revolving door? Why is so many people leaving? You have to look at that versus am I not hiring the right talent? It's not that you're not hiring the right person. You're not training. You're not, you know, you're not embracing, yeah. you're not growing, you're not planting the seed, watering it every day. Um, that's what I think this group does well versus a lot of other hospitality groups out there where they really want to invest in, in their employees you know they really want to make sure you grow and you're happy um that's what i really think and you know there's more eyes on the prize in in a larger group and it's one of those where instead of instead of a picture of 20 dogs with one bone you know picture 20 dogs hooked up to a sled that's now going to pull the company that's what i think is the best Mm. visualization of tau group you know instead of most most groups out there you have so many bosses that are, you know, trying to undercut each other and backstab each other. And, you know, here's one of those things, like, let's get it all out on the table. We can argue. If you want to argue, we can be nice. You want to be nice, but we all have the same goal and let's make sure we get there together. That's what I think it sets Tau group apart from uh, from a lot of other hospitality groups. That is so amazing. I love that. And I think that's such a good point. Obviously, like I, I love that line, treating your employees like you treat your guests, because I'll tell you as an agency working with restaurants, whenever I'm on a phone call with someone, one of the questions I ask is, all right, you know, where are you at financially and where you want to go? And I asked one of the questions of, you know, and what's preventing you from getting to that next level. Oftentimes it's 
good employees. Oftentimes right. it's employee retention. Oftentimes mm -hmm. it's, I don't know how to find good people or people keep quitting. But I think the, the message here is, yeah, well, your business, especially in this business, your employees are everything. Hey, food and service is the business. Service is half the battle. If you can't find the right kind of employees that, will, that can treat your guests right because you don't treat them right, well, what are we even doing here? Right? Yeah. I mean, um, here's, here's the perfect example. Everyone always says, okay, I love Union Square Hospitality Group. If someone, if someone is leaving, like a server, a manager, a sous chef, whatever, oh, they work at Union Square Hospitality Group, you know, hire them, hire them, hire them. And then they're like, oh, you know, this person didn't really work out the way I wanted to work out. It's like, okay, why did they leave Union Square Hospitality Group? You know, like, it's great. They have a great training program, but something went wrong. And it was probably them, not Union Square Hospitality Group. You know, so those are the got red it. flags that I think people just get. They see the bright lights. They get all happy. Like, oh, I got a great candidate. I got a great candidate. And they think you can just go to a store, get a manager off the shelf and put them in place and everything is going to work itself out. You know, yeah. um, little do you know that manager got let go but no one said they were fired you know there's so many things that you don't see but those are the things that i think you know we're starting to look at whereas high you know hire 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 the person that you really feel good about and then train them you know say we joke about all the time how many chefs does it take to change a light bulb you know like 10 you have one actually doing it nine will tell you how many different ways they did it in their last job you know oh people always joke about that but it's, <laughs> that's it's awesome like when you hire someone it's, you know, this is, that's great. You did it that way at the last shop. This is the way we're going to do it here. This is the way you're going to do it here. You know, is that understood? Then you can move forward. You know, once you lay the rules out on the table, um, you know, anybody can cook a potato, but this is the way we're going to cook the potato here, you know? And as long as you have the people that are saying, I'm willing to do your SOP, you know, I'm willing to do it the way you want me to do it, then, then everything else will fall into place. So basically as long as they're coachable. And that, that's how we yeah, hire two exactly. our company is, is it, yeah, I, I think in any kind of business, you, you want to have specific systems and processes if you want to do anything at scale and do it the right way and effectively, right? I think hiring coachable yeah. people is so, so important for any kind of business. Um, when it comes to hiring for you guys in general, though, what, what does your hiring process look like? Do you guys do something in specific and how do you weed out the, the right or wrong people? Oh, it's a huge, uh, so obviously once you hire that person, it's, you know, that's, that's the tough part because if you hire the wrong person, it's a huge, huge battle, right? Absolutely. So it is, it, it's, it, there's at least three different interviews from three different aspects. You know, obviously with the HR having, uh, my questions are going to be different from HR questions, right? Um, my question is going to be more of the line of tell me about your experience. Where have you worked? Why did you like that cuisine? Why did you leave? What did you learn from that chef? Whereas HR is looking for someone that's, you know, really going to, um, you know, add, you know, obviously we all looking for added value. Um, but my, you know, my questions are going to be more tailored towards the kitchen. And so bringing someone in, it's definitely, I can't just say, Hey, love you, Brett, you're hired. You know, it's definitely mm -hmm. a three-step process, uh, with individualized interviews where, you know, I might not even be in the room for two of those interviews. Um, and then having multiple people sign off on the hire. So I think that's really important because it's just like the government where you have your checks and balances. Um, like for instance, at dig in, they used to do group interviews and it was really interesting. They used to bring wow. around 20 people together. Um, they would put Legos in the middle and group them into groups of three and four. So now we're watching from a psychological level where you would say, okay, you have one minute, you have to build a structure that's freestanding, 11 inches tall. Halfway through, you'd say, okay, you now have 20 seconds. You need to bake it 15 inches tall, and I'm taking away two of the Legos. So now you see who's going to take charge, who's going to sit back. You know, you got to see those aspects. Wow. And, um, yeah. And another great question that we used to that's ask. That's so cool. Or they might still ask is, you know, what is your spirit animal, right? And what we were looking for was, we were looking for pack animals. We were looking for animals that were nice. We're, so if someone was like, I'm a wolf, you would ask him, why, why do you identify with a wolf? Like, are, is that person a lone wolf? Is mm. that person going to not work well with others? You know, if someone said, I'm a lion because I'm the king of the jungle, like, are you hiring them for managed position or are you hiring them for an entry-level line position where this is going to become a problem? You know, there's, 
there's a lot of psychological studies now being like really, really introduced into just normal everyday hiring, which I think goes a long way because anyone can BS their way through an interview. You know, anyone can make up a fake resume. Anyone, when I used, I used to be a corporate chef, I used to give every single chef a practical and a written test. The practical would be, you know, cook. You have no idea how many chefs can't cook rice, right? I would give them a cup of rice and say, cook this rice perfectly. I would give them a piece of salmon, say, sear this fish. I, they had to make a bechamel. They had to make, um, they had to make a bechamel. They had to also cook half a piece of chicken. Um, they had to cut an onion. They had to slice half, dice the other half. The slice I want to caramelize. The dice I wanted sauteed, no color. And then, yeah. you know, the written test. I would say it's not. I'm not going to ever judge you for this written test, but I want to know your level of food knowledge. I want to know your techniques. You know, totally. I want to know if you know what the danger zone is. You know, I want to know what you, if you know what a PISMO and what PISMO stands for. You know, those are things that I wanted to know because I just met you, you know, and if I'm going to hire you and give you the <laughs> responsibility of a management position, I need to know where you are. So then we can start to train you, coach you and get you where you need to be. Totally. But I think, I think you bring up a good point just now is, is that there's, there's certain aspects like that you can train for, such as a skill set on how to cook a bowl of rice, right? How to yep. do that correctly, right? That you guys have a specific process that you follow, you can train someone to do, and you want to make sure that they're obviously coachable to do that. But then there's also this, the aspect of like, what's your spirit animal? Because we want to know your personality type. And if you fit specifically in that role as a personality, and I think for personality, I mean, that, that's such a difficult thing to train for, obviously, right? People are certain ways and it, it's hard to get out of those ways sometimes, right? I love that question mm -hmm. about what is your spirit animal? I've never heard anyone say that. Yeah. That's, that's a good one. Um, what about personality tests? Have you guys trained that kind of stuff or, or not exactly? See, have you, have you guys tried any kind of personality tests? Wait, say that again. You cut off for a second. I, I was saying, have you, have you guys tried any kind of like personality tests when hiring employees? Have you so guys done here, any of that? Here at Tau Group, not yet. Um, you know, I, I'm sure it's going to happen. Like at Dig In, they, they did a, the Briggs Meyer uh, personality test. And it was more to identify you as a manager and how to, and how to help you grow. Um, you know, and it's actually kind of funny. I just, took, I just took it again just for the hell of it last week. And it turns nice. out I'm like 99% extroverted, which makes a lot of sense. Because like the last thing I want to do is be home alone. That's totally. literally my nightmare. You know, my days off, I, I'm like, you know, texting friends. If my girlfriend's not home, I'm like, hey, what are you guys doing? Let's go try this place or, you know, whatever it may be. But being home alone is just it's boring to me. Absolutely. No, I agree. I totally agree. Um, one thing I also want to talk to you about, Stephen, is just overall food trends. Have you guys... Um, I mean, I know you've been at Tau Group for, what, about a year, I think, right? Essentially? Yeah. 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 Um, what, what kind of trends have you seen that, that have you guys seen become more and more popular during this year? So, obviously, for the last, what, for the last eight years, Instagram, right? So, you have user-generated content. You know, anything yeah. with user-generated content is going to take off. Anything that you can Instagram and then it's going to get that person more likes, it's going to bring you more views, I think is, is huge, you know? Um, yep crazy thing one of one of the burger influences would always say hey you get 25 percent more likes if you use yellow cheese versus white cheese right and that has nothing to do with the flavor profile the texture everything that we've been trained as chefs it just goes out the window just you want more likes use yellow cheese right so i think that, wow. that's a huge trend all within itself um second thing is you have you had that plant forward plant-based movement right Everybody is now more well aware of, hey, if you eat a rack of ribs every night, you're probably going to get colon cancer in like 20 years. So you know, <laughs> yeah. being plant-based, finding, finding your proteins elsewhere, I think it, it's you know, huge. But just making vegetables delicious again is, I think, the, the evolution that we're now, we're now experiencing. Because before... If you looked at the 80s and the 90s, when you thought of vegetables, you thought of the overcooked Brussels that came out of the microwave. You thought of peas and carrots. If you say peas and carrots, you think hospital food, right? But no, these things can be absolutely, utterly delicious 
when yep. prepared the right way. So I think, you know, totally. having places like Dirt Candy in New York City and all these places that are plant-based and plant-forward, that's really what I think is propelling. Um, you know, and now being able to look at a farmer and having a regular person look at a farmer and say, wow, you know, thank you, you know, um, that's, that's huge for us. So I think, Got you know, it. definitely the plant-based um, fish is coming back more popular than ever. You know, you have, if I hear the word omakase one more time, um, you know, I think the two things that, the two words that I joke about that are overused is tapas and omakase, right? Really? It's, it's become a marketing, yeah, it's become like this marketing tactic where you want to open up a bar, but you have to serve food because that's what they told you to. What do you do? Oh, small place, tapas, right? You hire like a chef, you're like, I just want tapas. Interesting. Um, chef's tasting menu, you know, everyone keeps calling it omakase, omakase. Like I worked omakase for Morimoto. Um, most of the omakase that we know today is not omakase, but everyone just loves that word. So, you know, it's marketing. Marketing works. Um, yeah. Marketing tells me what soap to buy, you know, what brands to buy. Of course, it works. So there's nothing wrong with it. But I think, um, you know, I think the trends in the future now with everything going to QSR, uh, not QSR, um, the QR codes, right? Yes, yes. I, I've always joked that we should have a tasting menu, but it's based off of like Tinder. So the picture of the next dish comes up. You oh want my it, you God. swipe right, it comes to you. If you don't want it, you swipe left, it doesn't come to you. And then you pay on what you consume, you know? So like as a chef, I would prepare like 30 small little tastes taste of that night. And then you'd come sit at the sit at my restaurant and then swipe right if you want that dish, swipe left if you don't want that bite. And then you just pay for what you ate. And then obviously, you know, it's, it's a ton of user generated content and a ton of what people are used to nowadays, you know, swiping right, swiping left. And I think it'd just be a fun, quirky. Um, that is amazing. Wow. No, Steven, you bring a lot of interesting things here. I mean, going back to what you just said though, about even initially on this, on this topic of user generated content, creating food that gets more likes, creating food using yeah. yellow cheese or this color cheese because it gets more likes. I don't think I've ever heard anyone else speak about this. And it seems so obvious, right? So, I mean, for you yeah. guys at Tower Group, obviously the, the marketing play, a, a big part of it sounds like is creating food that looks, looks beautiful. That's going to get social attention, right? Obviously, right? Yep. So Absolutely. for you specifically, you make it so you specifically as a chef, I mean, how, how do you get that kind of data? What, are, you, are you speaking to those on the ground floor? How, how, do, you, how do you get this information? How do you decide when it's, you're making new dishes? It's definitely the marketing team. We have a huge marketing team. Um, but when we're making the dishes, it is partly, one has to be delicious, right? If it doesn't yes. taste good, don't even bother bringing it. You know, there's different levels of, even though I'm the executive chef, I have a lot of bosses. Um, so everything yeah. gets tasted, you know, uh, every level up gets tasted. Um, and by the time you're done with it, it could be a completely new dish, you know? So you as an executive chef, you have to keep that mentality of this is the business. This is our business. It's not my business, not your business. This is what's going to make the business money, you know? So you can, you can have an idea. Um, but you have to keep in the back of your mind that don't be married to one specific dish or entree or whatever it's going to change it will change it might change for the better it might change for the worse but if it it's going to change you know and as long as you're open to change i think you can be a successful executive chef in a large group like this you know if you're totally. one of those guys my way the highway you got to go open up your own little tiny you gotta shop open. do yeah. you yeah 100 percent because that's it will that's change, you know that's that's been kind of our theme this entire year is that hey change is not an option it's a requirement uh, yep. li literally, I mean, you know, for us as an agency, right, we used to only focus, or one of our taglines is we turn web traffic into foot traffic. Well, gotcha. uh, hey, sorry, uh, during COVID, that, that wasn't a thing, right? Yeah. <laughs> so we, we've had to make some adjustments and now push online orders and stuff like that, um, which was an incredibly big change for us as an agency, right? We never done it before because a lot of our clients said, hey, I don't, I don't want to push my online orders I make less on that. I, I can't drive higher ticket averages. I can do that in store. So can we focus on just that? So we did that. COVID changed everything, right? Yeah. Um, it, it's, it, this is really, really interesting though. And I kind of want to stick on for like just a minute because uh, again, no one else I've spoken to has, has spoken about making decisions on what they're going to create in the kitchen based on the looks of their food, specifically from what they're getting received, getting feedback from maybe social media, right? Um, sure. Do you guys do you guys ever test different 
looks and then compare them? I mean, how, how are you, are you A-B testing some kind of food items to see what's performing better or worse and then deciding what to stick with? Or how, well, do, you, we, how do you go about doing that? There definitely are. There de- regionally, you know, there's some dishes that work in LA that do not work in New York. There's some dishes that work in New York that don't work in Vegas. Um, and we'll throw it on as a special. If it makes it on its menu item, same thing. You know, we're constantly, every single day, I look at different product mixes and seeing what's selling, what's not selling. Why is it not selling? Um, that's a huge, huge play into like what I do on a day to day. But I also think it's, it's one of those things like just because we designed a dish for me, it's, it's getting you in the door, right? It's, yeah. we made something that you saw on Instagram. We got you in the door. Now we have you in for an hour and a half, two hours. We have you now we want to give you the best experience because we want you to come back. We want you to talk to your friends. We want you to post. So the Instagram you know, designing dishes for Instagram is more of just getting someone in the door. You know, Got once it. they're in the door, we'll take it from there. Uh, so I don't think it's the end goal. You know, I think it's just that at first, like the invitation. Here's your invite. You're welcome. Come on down. Uh, come have a night with us. Um, once you're there, of course, that that experience, you know, whether we're using dry ice and pouring water table side to create the cloud of smoke, um, whether, you know, um, if like, I opened the original catch and we, you know, we used to do the catch, cool. sushi, the, the catch sushi roll was always torched at the sushi bar. Now it's torch table side. Why? Ooh, ah, uh, you know, you're looking at the fire, you're smelling, you're smelling the fire. <laughs> yes. You're about to eat, you know, it's very animalistic. Like I have made fire that sort of, sort of mentality. Yes. And it's something where it's going to, that, that little experience versus, Hey, I went for sushi. It was boring. Not going to tell anyone versus, Hey, did you look at my story? Like they have this amazing role and you know, you're, you're going to love it and blah, blah, blah. And I made friends with the manager and he's going to get us a reservation next time. And those are the things of just getting you here is, you know, the biggest challenge. Once you're here, this is what we do. Well, you know, allow us to wine and dine you, if you will. Got it, man. It, what you just mentioned about what's happening at Catch. I've, I've been and I've been to Catch many times in the, the LA location in, in in Hollywood. It's a fantastic restaurant. Obviously, you guys kill it there. Yeah. Um, but it's it's so funny what you're saying because I'm thinking about, oh my god, the the, the number of girls on Instagram that want to post that story, <clears throat> walking in the entrance. The, num- the number of girls yep. that post that sushi roll getting torched or the dessert yep. that you hit at the end or whatever. It's, 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 it's part of, it's part of having fun. It's part of the game. It's part of yep. what, what, what can I showcase to my friends? And that's free marketing, obviously. You know what? Here's my, here during Corona, we had nothing but time, right? So I said, the only way, like, let's say tomorrow, someone's like, here's 5 million. All right, go open a place. What I would do is I would create a, a, like a mute, like I would want you to flow through like you was, would a Stu Leonard's or a museum or, you know, you come through, we take your ticket, you walk through the turnstile and you have 15 minutes in the first room where we do the first dish and the first cocktail, you and your friends, nine, nine other people. And yeah. then it's experience, but then you move to the next room and you move to the next room and it's sanitized every time before the movement happens Ooh. where I can then, I can then move 200 people through, you know, every, let's just say, 12 minutes, 15 minutes, whatever it may be, but then really keep it where you're not in the same room as 200 people breathing the same air and possibly contaminating each other. And it's a way I can control, you know, the, the, you know, the corralling, if you will, but at yeah. the same time, it's a new environment. Every single room, every single room could be set up for a different Instagram post, whether, you know, it's one theme on this and, you know, another theme on that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but that's what I, I think the future of dining is going to become where it's going to really feel like an, an eating tour experience where totally. you're going to go from room to room. And I'm sure people are already, you know, doing this, but I, I think, you know, in LA, in New York, in Vegas, definitely in Vegas, totally you, Vegas. That, um, you know, where it's one room might be sushi and, you know, next room might be, you know, there, it, there, it's limitless what you can think about, but that's one way you can really keep everyone safe, sanitize, you yeah. know, and then you're also controlled. You were in that room with your nine friends and that's it, you know, like no one else um, versus being in a, being in a restaurant with 200 people you don't know. That is interesting. That is super interesting. I mean, I, I, I'll tell you this in, in general, Stephen, I, I think so many restaurants, they just completely miss the ball in the experience thing. I yep. mean, okay, I'll, t- I'll tell you this. 
for us as an agency, right? We, we don't create content for our clients. We, we don't, so we, we run ads for restaurants, right? And we, our whole thing that we specialize in is we help bring someone who sees an ad online inside the restaurant. We can track an ROI. That, that is our big value add. So we can actually see, Hey, you spent 10,000 here or you spent a thousand here, whatever it is, the budget was, and we track this much back. Hey, that's great. Right. The biggest pain point for the majority of restaurants that I've seen is creating content that looks actually good. Right. hundred percent. What, what, you know, what, what is the deal? I, I, I'm just kind of curious for those people who aren't investing in the look and feel of their food or, 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 or the presentation of their food or the presentation of the restaurant. Can, what, what would you have to say to those people? Because I think obviously for you guys, it's, it's such a big factor and it's such a re- big reason for you guys success. What, what would you tell those people who just aren't investing the time into making presentable uh, food in general? You know what it is? It's, I'm not, I'm not very artistic myself, but I would force myself yeah. to go to museums. I would yep. force myself to go look at beautiful things because it's not the way my brain works. You know, I'm a very business-minded uh, scientific thinker and yep. I, I knew my flaw. So it's one of those things like, how many times have you been to like, just a coffee shop with a neon with just one thing and now that's all over Instagram? You know, whether, whatever the saying is, just one little neon, what did it, it cost you like a thousand dollars max? And the amount of posts that you're going to get from that and the amount of foot traffic and the amount of people coming, they don't even, they're not even here for the coffee. Like, you know, that's really, they're not <laughs> yeah. even here for the coffee. They're here to take that picture underneath that neon sign that's going to make it, make them look all So they can look Instagram. cool on social media, 100%. 100%, you know. Steven, have you, have you been, you mentioned going to museums. Have you been to a museum of ice cream? Of course. Of course. Yeah. I went so, when, they first, when they first had it here in New York next to the Whitney not the Whitney. Yeah. The untitled. Yeah. At the Whitney over here, we went, you know, they had the, a lot of fun, but I mean, I waited in the line, got tickets when my yeah. girlfriend, my girlfriend's a pastry chef, you know, we had a lot of fun and now it's taken off into something that was what only going to be like a 10 week thing in the beginning. Literally. And it's exactly what you're saying. I mean, it's, it, so it's funny. Uh, Mary Ellis Bunn, who started it, she's the, the founder and CEO. I went to high school with her. We're just hilarious. That's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> and she was such a cool girl in high school crazy. and just, just an awesome, awesome rad chick in general. But you know, it, it's, it's amazing what she's done. And, and it's literally, it's exactly what you're saying is, is all she wanted to do is I wanted to create a cool experience. seems like people like ice cream and uh, you know, let, let's go for it and see what happens. I mean, she, she is a total example of this is that people want that experience. And I think big yeah. thing for her, I know she mentioned that she said this on, on multiple um, press releases or whatever the case you know, the, the millennial generation, they're, they're craving experiences, right? They're, they're, not, they're not as interested in buying specific products, materialistic things. Mm-hmm. There's, they're more interested in the experience. Um, and it seems like you guys have definitely capitalized on this. It seems like a lot more restaurants need to start thinking about these things. And it seems like even now so, because of COVID, now more than ever. Because remember, there's less options of fun things to do. And restaurants yeah. are, are, are some of the unique businesses still in business that can offer those unique experiences. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, I do. I mean, two points. One, I think if you open something too broad, like a museum of food and drink, the one in, here in Brooklyn, I think it's a little too broad where it gets lost. Yeah. Right. If you, you open up the museum of ice cream, boom, I know what it is. It, it's happy. It's amazing. It's fun. And yes. so it's the same thing when, when a lot of the salad places were designing salads if you give a human too many options, it's a failure on both sides. They don't know what yep. they want. And you know, the, 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 the customer is frustrated. The person taking the order is frustrated. Everyone's frustrated. But if you give them like 21 choices or less, everyone's happy. If you design a menu, people are like, no, that's what I want. Versus if I said, okay, these are all of our ingredients. You design, we'll cook it like real bespoke cooking. It actually does not work. You know, I think, to be specific, like a museum of ice cream versus museum of food and drink, that's why it works. You know, people identify with that one thing and say, yes, that's what I want. You gotta, um, you gotta be niche. You gotta be yeah. niche. Yeah. Yeah. Is that the magic? hundred yeah, percent. Is that the magic number? You said 21 or less from what you see as an executive that's, chef? That's, that's what I've, that's what I've heard from marketing, from marketing companies was 21 or less. And that's from everything from ice cream toppings to salad mm. toppings. Um, you know, for a couple of years ago, we opened up a place. It was like a food hall. We had a bunch of, bunch of companies on the main floor, but then we also did all of the sandwiches and salads and, you know, that sort of thing. And it was a grocery store downstairs. It's a picture like in Italy, right? 
Totally. And when we were doing the salad bar, that's what I was talking to the marketing company. The marketing company would go, like, well, don't do more than 21 options because you're just going to carry more SKUs and it's going to cost you more money and people are not even going to want that specific blah, 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 you know, whatever it may yes. be. So we took yes. that and yeah, it made sense. It definitely made a lot of sense. Wow. You, you mentioned earlier also that, you know, obviously you, you want to get that experience. That's, that's what we've been talking about this whole time. But, but what about getting people in the door the first time? You said that's, a, that's obviously a difficult thing to do. What's been a strategy for you guys? I mean, obviously when someone comes in, they share that social content, that's attracting inherently more people. But what other kind of strategies have you guys come up with to bring some people in? Do you guys run um, ads so on social we, media as well? We don't do ads through social media. Uh, we do a mm-hmm. lot of social media. Uh, we yeah. do a lot of, you know, outreach. But even so, we are run, since we've reopened, we have run a restaurant week style menu um, for the first hour of every single night and available for delivery the entire time we're open. So for $42, wow. you can appetize an entree and a dessert. So that's an amazing deal if you go to town, like an amazing, amazing deal. You're actually, you know, you're almost stealing from us. So we want to be able to seat that first hour from 5 to 6 p.m. And it, it's been working. You know, people are like, I want to go to Tao, but I don't want to break the bank. How do we do this? Let's go for the first hour. Let's, you know, for $42 a person, I can afford that. Plus tip, nice. yeah, let's go. You know, and then um, that's a huge thing. And then, and then a lot of these people are, are living in the area and they're like, you know what? I'm just going to get that delevered for $42. That's, that's a great deal. Appetizer, an entree, and a dessert for $42. Totally. Bucks. That's, it's a phenomenal, phenomenal deal. So I think by discounting um you know it's getting it's getting people to get through the door and maybe they come at 5 p.m and then next week you just graduated blah 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 we got to celebrate that same person's like hey you know what i went to this place called tau it was phenomenal let's go back you know and then they'll comment for the 8 p.m reservation and really spend some money absolutely and and what about for delivery for you guys take out or delivery do you, do you guys have any kind of special packaging for your guests when it comes oh, to yeah. that or so, we we have the most expensive packaging, right? Because we want that experience of you coming to Tao to translate to your home. We have the containers that you are going to keep. You know, we have the containers that you're going to wash and it's going to be part of your Tupperware. We have even the bags. I love that. You know, these, these are like gold bags that are specially ordered. And these are the, ba- it's free marketing because people use these bags over and over and over again. <laughs> it's um, amazing. Even the chopsticks, even the chop, like even the cutlery that we give you, is like the most high-end disposable cutlery and people wash them and keep them, you know, like it's, totally. it's something where we want that guest experience to translate to the home, even if you're not here. So that's it's, so it's, cool. And it goes, it goes very far and people acknowledge it. People actually write back. This is the best container. I use it all the time. Or I packed my kids lunch in it every day, or, you know, they really acknowledge it and they have contacted us and told us about it. That's amazing. It's, it's like, it's like when you buy an Apple product, right? And, and you just yep. see, you see people, they just keep the boxes. And I do, I find myself doing the same thing. I'm like, fuck, what am I doing? Like, why, why do I, yeah. why do I need this like, box? This amazing box. Yeah. You don't want to throw it 100%. away. You, you feel like you're throwing away the product or something. Um, yeah. How do you, I'm curious, how are you, how are you guys getting this feedback too? Is it through social media? Do they write you guys emails? How are you guys getting feedback yeah, from we, your customers on this? All of the above. So all we're on every platform delivery wise. <laughs> um, we get a lot of feedback through the platforms. We get a lot of feedback through social media. Um, so each, for instance, like each restaurant has one person in the marketing team dedicated to that restaurant. So it's always that wow. same person posting. It's always that same voice, if you will, you know, the same, mm. the same look. Um, so that way, because a lot of times you'll see a restaurant social media and you'll be able to tell like, oh, you know, someone else posted today. You know, that wasn't, the, that wasn't their normal vibe. That wasn't their normal. Yeah. So here it's, it's something where it's there because there is a voice behind posting. You know, there is a story. Totally. To be told. Um, so it's always the same. It's always the same person. And that feedback comes back. It actually comes back too much, uh, honestly. And, in, in, you know, we have a marketing call. And it, there's a lot of things that, of course, I just want to focus on the food. You know, like there's a lot of things that I consider white noise. But then you have to step back and say, no, that wasn't white noise. That was actually great feedback. And, you know, we really should listen to every form of feedback. I think that's, I think that's so important. It, it seems like for me, the restaurants that, that we've spoken to, obviously, like there, there isn't much of a connection between the marketing side or front of house to the, maybe the back of the house with the chef, right? And, and obviously, it sounds like those people are they're making such a massive mistake. It's so Huge. important for you, right? I mean, this, this is yeah. incredible. And, and not just that, but... 
obviously when it comes down to everything, um, not just the food and service, but hey, w- w- the packaging. I mean, that's so cool that you're getting that. That's so cool. That feedback is amazing. Um, this marketer you're working with, obviously social media seems like it's a pretty big challenge for you guys. What about like email and text marketing? Do you, do you guys do anything like that kind of stuff? A lot of email. Uh, yep. No texting, <clears throat> but a lot of emails. Yeah. Got it. Got it. Got it. Um, how important for you guys w- w- would you say, I mean, technology wise, have you, have you made any kind of new changes and advancements because of COVID? Um, and, and how much more so, has social media made an impact on you guys? Yeah, doing this, I, mean, I was going to say, yeah. All of our menus, we, we don't give out menus anymore. You know, all of our menus are the QR codes. Um, so on the table, you take a picture with your phone. And now, I mean, that's great because now you have that data connection between you and, and, and the guest. Um, you're able Wait, to- Wait, one, one, one real- second on that though. So you're, you're, you're saying mm-hmm. through the QR code, you're, you're making a connection with the customer. Um, yeah, because then you can click through, join the email list, join the newsletters. You know, there's a I lot see. of options. Like we're not collecting your data. You know, you can't, you, I'm not saying you take a picture of the QR code and all of a sudden, you know, you belong to Russia. It's, it's more of like you are now have the option. We, we also show you what else is going on in the other properties. Um, like, you know, for instance, like Las Vegas is almost fully open, right? You have Marquis yes. Pool, you, you know, there's so, you have, you have a lot of places that are offering more that, you know, someone might not know the highlight room in LA, you know, like it's open right now. You know, there's a lot of things that I didn't know that the door. Yeah, yeah exactly. You know, and that's it's, cool. It's doing, it's doing really well. And, you know, I think hopefully all of our properties kill it, you know, and continue to kill it. But it's, it's one of those things where I think in my opinion, the QR code versus a menu is, so brilliant because one, how many times have you been part of a restaurant that misprinted a menu and spent money on that print and they printed 500 copies and now yep. it has to get reprinted and now everyone's aggravated. Everyone's annoyed. The restaurant doesn't have the menus they want. People are, you know, screaming at each other about not proofreading. It's like your initials are on the menu. You proofread. Did you not look? Were you paying attention? But here I can change it in 30 seconds, 20 seconds. You can change the menu. You know, it's all digital. And then from there, it's, it, the possibilities are endless, limitless. You know, you can, you can bring up a video. Let's, let's say you come in and you choose, um, I don't know, you choose a sushi roll, right? I can yeah. immediately pop up a video on your phone of how that sushi roll is made. I can pop up information about where that fish is from. I can pop, you know, I can, I can offer oh, this information wow. in real time. I can offer a million things. And then if you really want to, you know, go down that rabbit hole, you can continue to go down that rabbit hole. And well, so your, your guys' so menu is, your, your guys' menu sounds incredibly interactive. So, I mean, essentially, you, you've just enhanced your customer experience way more than it was before. There's a paper menu because it's so limited. You guys actually have that video footage and stuff like that within the menu so we itself? Have, How does that so work? We've been doing a lot of video, you know, content creating every single week. The marketing team is content creating. So that's the goal because, right, all right, so for instance, right now you buy a hand roll kit to go, okay? You get the hand roll kit, you get it delivered, it gets picked up inside of the QR, it's a little pamphlet with your QR code and you click on it and all of a sudden the video pops up on how to make the perfect hand roll. Oh um, my God. Done, done by one of our, you know, corporate, corporate sushi chefs. And so it's traditional, wow. it's, you know, and it's limitless what you can really do with this now. And in my opinion, instead of being afraid of technology, you have to embrace technology, use it as, you know, use it, use it there for your advantage. You know, don't ever, don't ever be afraid of it. I think, I personally think, you know, robots are the future. I love robots. I don't, I don't think they're ever going to take my job. I don't think they're going to take any cook job. I would love to be able to help program these robots. They're going to start cooking, you know, because then to have food and technology (laughs) is going to become the same where that's where I want, you know, my career to, to go towards. Totally. Um, but it's one of those things where there's so many people that are against it. You know, it's a fear of the unknown. I get it. So, you know, do a little more reading on your end. You know, do a little more homework on your end. Um, yes. The biggest thing that I think right now in food technology is none of the food tech, none of the technology talks to each other. That's I think, is the biggest, biggest, biggest hindrance to food technology as a whole. None of yep. the technology talks to each other. You know, even the fact that let's just say we have a seamless, a Grubhub, a Caviar, a Talk, a, you know, all of these platforms on. So you have like five to seven tablets at the delivery station, right? 
Why can't I yep. just have, well, obviously there is now a program that runs all of your delivery platforms at once, but something as simple as that, that technology doesn't speak to each other when in binary, that's all it was supposed to do is talk to each other, you know? Yep. Yep. So that's where I think, I think the, you know, we need a consortium of food technology, which uh, there is this food tech meetups all the time, but still it's not enough, you know, there, because everybody wants to make their dollar, you know, everyone, there's no open sourcing, uh, everybody's still, you know, for profit, for profit, which is that's human nature, that's capitalism, um, which totally. I get, but I think that's our downfall right now. Once food technology starts talking to each other, it's, it's the, you know, the, evol the revolution will be turned into an evolution. Cool. Got it. Got it. This is, this is really good stuff, Stephen. This is, <laughs> this is so cool. I mean, again, sure. No, no one has brought this up of, of the idea of, of a tutorial to make your sushi roll with the QR code that's comes in the box. I mean, that, that is incredible. Um, so obviously, you know, you, you guys have a, a, a pretty amazing staff. It sounds like helping you guys make these videos, implement the QR codes. Um, do you guys, I'm kind of curious, what kind of software do you guys use when it comes to the interactive menu? Is it something specific that you, that you can tell us about or are you not sure? Um, so this so that, is I'm really great positive. stuff. Okay. Yeah, that actually, I'm not, I'm not 100% positive on what software we use. Okay, got it, got it. But that is, that is really cool. And then secondly, on, on the robots, um, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know if you've seen this or not, but have you seen Postmates, is, I think it's Postmates, they're starting to put these robots on the streets that are picking up food and delivering them to, to people in the area. We, we actually we have a client called Fat Sal's in, in West Hollywood. I'm, I'm not sure if you've heard of Fat Sal's, but they, <laughs> they have this robot that's picking up and delivering sandwiches um, have you seen it like that yet? Have you guys tried anything like that yet? No, or I mean, not yet? we haven't. I, you know, I think it's, I think it's going to be tough in New York city because of how populated New York city is, but yeah. it's, it's happened. Because if you look at how many Uber drivers and, uh, caviar and, you know, Uber eats and how many bikes there are and how many delivery people, even Amazon go now, it's, it's, it's crazy. And how many people are in the area. Um, yeah. so to replace, I don't know, 20 people. Cause they said in the future, when cars really drive themselves, those cars are never going to stop. You know, the model is going to be, yeah. so the cars will just keep going and just pick you up almost like it's a bus. Um, so I, I mean, I can picture the same thing with the robots. Got it. Got it. No, this is, this is such interesting stuff. And, and, and again, I think the, the, the base, the, the biggest theme of this whole podcast today is it sounds like, again, for you guys specifically, I mean, you guys obviously have amazing food and service, but the, also the entertainment, entertainment aspect of all this is what's really pushing you guys forward in, in so much amazing ways. This is really, really cool. Um, yeah. Steven, for, for, for any uh, other restaurateurs who are listening to this, and we're just, we only have a couple minutes left on this, but I just, I, I, I'd like you to, to just, if you can, share any kind of lasting pieces of advice that you feel like you have for anyone right now that maybe is currently struggling or had a really tough time during COVID and just kind of getting over that hump. What is some piece of advice that you would, you would tell them specifically right now as a restaurateur, if they want to continue thriving on forward? I mean, the first things first is manage your P&L, you know, control your bottom line. Um, yep. If you're bleeding out, you know, stop the hemorrhaging, turn it, turn it, you know, like turn it into a slow, slow controllable bleed that you can then plot and then start becoming profitable. I think that's the first and foremost is, you know, we are all in the business to make money. Um, yeah. Second, you know, the, the famous thing is restaurants don't fail. They run out of money, right? So secure, secure, secure your investors, your financers, um, as much money you think it's going to take, get triple the amount. Um, and just know that for any given second, you're going to get a fine from the city. Your something is going to break. You're going to have to shell out 10 grand. You're going to have to shell out 20 grand. This is the business we're in. If you can't handle it, don't be in it. Um, so it's really, you know, the financing side of it. Uh, the second is, you know, keep an open mind just because you designed the best dish in your mind doesn't mean it's going to work for everyone. You know, be yeah. open to change, be open and play the devil's advocate to yourself. Listen to yourself, speak out the other side whether it's a dish, whether it's a new set of bar stools, whether it's, you know, whether it doesn't matter what it is, look at it from every single angle, your angle, your opposing, you know, the opposing angle, every single angle, and then really see what's going to make you money. Um, Cause that's, that's the name of the game. Otherwise going to non-for-profit, you know, um, that's really what it is. And, you know, 
instead of instead of being so I, I everyone always asks what's next, what's next, what's trendy, what's trendy. Stop yeah. thinking about what's trendy and how about you become the trendsetter. You know, let let's start yeah. creating and let's start create two hundred things. Create two hundred things. One of them's gonna work, right? Versus yeah paying attention to 200 different people and seeing what they're doing and try to copycat that is who cares to spend yep. the time now, educate yourself, create. And if it doesn't work great, learn from the experience. I love making mistakes. I tell this people to people all the time, making mistakes is one of my favorite things to do because the amount that I've learned from that mistake, you have to take it and really learn from it, you know, yeah. and that's going to set you apart. Yeah. You, you brought up an interesting point. I, and I think Jeff Bezos actually speaks about this. It's, it's about, it's about obsessing with your customers, not with your competition. Stop looking at what everyone else is doing, right? And look at your, look at your customers. Where, where are they getting the biggest reaction from? What food items make the most excited? What are they posting about? What's getting the most likes? What, what brings the most people to the restaurant? And I think that that's so, so important. Um, Steven, this, this, is, this has been incredible. And, I, and I'm sure there's probably a lot of our listeners that, that would like to potentially follow up with you and, and, and follow what you're doing. Um, if they, were, if they want to do that and they want to follow you on social media or whatever the case, how, how do they do so? What, what, are, your, what are some of your tags? Sure. In, Instagram, I am Tasty Goodness. Awesome. Um, and then Twitter, I am Bruce Leone. Uh, so a little backstory there is I'm Chinese, but I was raised in Long, on Long Island with all Italians. So it was always a funny joke of uh, combining Chinese food and Italian food. Oh, I food. love that. So it, it'd be Bruce Leone on Twitter, but Casey <laughs> Goodness is where I spend most of my time on Instagram. Awesome, man. Awesome, man. Well, Steven, this, this has been incredible. What I'm going to do after this podcast is make sure I have your links on this podcast so people check it out. Uh, but Steven, thanks a lot so much. You, you, you've, been, you've been fantastic. This has been such an amazing experience and uh, we'll be seeing you around. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Alrighty. See ya.